the Warhawk, the Tomahawk, and the Kitty Hawk. These were all names given to one aircraft, the Curtis P-40. Behind the P-51 Mustang and the P-47 Thunderbolt, it was the third most produced American fighter of the Second World War. Over 13,700 were produced between 1939 and 1944, and they came in a multitude of variants. This aircraft played a crucial role in the first half of the war. As America was not directly involved until the end of 1941, many of the early P-40s saw service with foreign countries, particularly those of the British Commonwealth. These were the toughest days for Britain and her allies, and the P-40s brought much needed relief. By the middle of 1942, P-40s would be serving in the Middle East, Africa, India, Burma, China, the Southwest Pacific, and the Soviet Union. But its absence over the skies of Western Europe often denied it the glory enjoyed by its younger cousins, the P-47 and the P-51. The P-40 did not perform well at high altitudes, and Western Europe was one of the few places where aerial combat routinely took place above 20,000 feet. Because of this deficiency, and partly due to some inaccurate post-war bias, the P-40 has often been labelled as mediocre. But this was certainly not the case. The P-40 proved to be a remarkably competent fighter when operated to its strengths, and the fact that over 200 Allied pilots became aces in the P-40 is certainly a testament to this. The P-40 also earned an excellent reputation for its survivability. It was by far one of the most durable single-seat fighters of the war, and this allowed it to adapt to other roles when its time as a frontline fighter had finally come to an end. Today, we're going to take a closer look at the remarkable history of this often underappreciated fighter, but to truly do it justice, to understand its strengths and weaknesses, we need to understand its origins, and this means taking a quick look at the P-40's ancestors, the Curtis Hawks. The Curtis Hawks were some of the most successful fighter aircraft from the interwar period. Between 1924 and 1938, Curtis produced over 700 Hawk biplanes. These were built in six different models, with over 30 variants between them, serving as interceptors, carrier fighters, fighter bombers, trainers, and some were even used as highly experimental airship-based scout aircraft. The Hawks were incredibly successful, both domestically and overseas. Hawk biplanes were operated by over a dozen different countries, and the constant supply of orders helped Curtis survive the worst of the Great Depression. The merger with Wright Aeronautical in 1929 also helped, with the newly formed Curtis Wright becoming the largest manufacturer of aircraft and aero engines in the United States. In the mid-1930s, Curtis Wright modernised their Hawks with the development of the Model 75, an all-metal monoplane fighter which became known as the P-36. This was a huge leap forward over the old biplanes. It was highly manoeuvrable, easy to maintain, and it was significantly faster. Once again, it proved to be popular at home and abroad, securing multiple orders from overseas customers, and like the biplane Hawks, it was shaping up to enjoy a long and fruitful service life. Ironically, its successor, the P-40, which became notorious for its lack of high-altitude performance, can trace its origins back to an aircraft that was designed with this very thing in mind. In mid-1937, before the first production contract for the P-36 had even been signed, its designer, Donovan Berlin, was already seeking a way to dramatically increase its performance. He had gotten wind of the new prototypes that were emerging in Europe, the Supermarine Spitfire and the Messerschmitt Bf 109, and he realised that American fighter aircraft were about to be considerably outclassed. The US Army Air Corps had no desire to fall behind, and they were not without options. The Allison V-1710, a powerful liquid-cooled V-12, was now becoming available, albeit after a slow start courtesy of the Great Depression. This engine was intended to power many of America's newest combat aircraft, but in 1937, none of these were yet available. Indeed, many of these only existed on the drawing board, but there was one exception. In a moment of foresight, Donovan Berlin had designed his P-36 so that it could be easily modified to take newer, more powerful engines, and he submitted a proposal to fit the Allison V-12 to the original Hawk 75 prototype. This was known as the Hawk 75i, a design that looked more like a 1930s racing aircraft rather than a pursuit fighter. It kept the wings, landing gear, and most of the tail of the original Hawk 75, but drastic changes were made to the fuselage and the nose. 
To maintain performance at high altitude, the Allison V12 was turbocharged, and this necessitated the lengthening of the fuselage to not only fit the engine, but also its radiators and the intercooler. This pushed the centre of gravity further forward, and to correct this, the cockpit was moved further back. The result was a very sleek airframe that promised much speed, but also one that offered pretty atrocious visibility, as the pilot had over 20 feet of plane in front of him. Despite concerns over said visibility, the estimated performance of the design was good enough that the Army Air Corps ordered a test aircraft to be built under the designation of XP-37. Though it seemed simple enough on paper, converting the Hawk prototype to this new configuration proved to be a challenge, and an expensive one at that. When the XP-37 was completed, the build cost had topped out at just over $104,000, which is about $2 million in today's money. Considering the production model of the P-36 only cost $23,000, this was a worrying development. The aircraft made its maiden flight in April of 1937, and the test pilots immediately complained about poor visibility, especially during taxiing when the nose and wing completely blocked forward vision. But the XP-37 did achieve a top speed of 340 miles an hour during its trials, and it promised to go even faster. As a result of its promising performance, the US Army ordered 13 test aircraft as the YP-37. Unfortunately, the XP-37 was let down by its turbocharger. As the development of multi-gear superchargers was somewhat behind those being developed in Europe, turbocharging was viewed as the easiest way to get high-altitude performance. But Donovan, Berlin and Curtis had underestimated the developments required to make such a high-power unit reliable. Metallurgy had not yet advanced enough to make a turbine wheel that could withstand the high RPMs required, and these early turbochargers had manual controls that had to be operated by the pilot, which was not exactly ideal for combat aircraft. As a result of these problems, the XB-37 project would ultimately fail, but lessons taken from this expensive experiment directly contributed to the P-40's development. In 1938, while the YP-37s were busy blowing up their turbochargers, the Army Air Corps announced a new competition for the development of a brand new pursuit fighter, with bids to be received in January of 1939. By this point, global tensions had become considerably more heated. The Sino-Japanese War had escalated, leading to a sharp decline in relations between the US and Japan, and Europe was becoming equally spicy, with increased Italian aggression and the recent German Anschluss of Austria. In response to this, the US Congress approved funds for a major build-up of the nation's military strength, and this included the acquisition of modern pursuit and bombing aircraft. Next generation aircraft are seldom produced overnight, the development of the Spitfire and the BF-109 being prime examples of this, but the army needed something that could compete with the fast fighters coming out of Europe, and the rumoured ones being developed by Japan. Because of this, they considered their initial specification as one for a stopgap fighter, one that could be produced quickly and buy time for more advanced models to be developed. The Army specification certainly reflected this line of thinking, but it also betrayed a lack of appreciation for what constituted an effective pursuit fighter. The specification called for a fighter with a top speed of 310 to 370 miles an hour, which was just enough to be competitive, but it only required this top performance to be achieved at 15,000 feet. This was anathema to the prevailing line of thought over in Europe, where high altitude performance was king, but this was not surprising when the potential military use of such an aircraft is considered. At the time when the specifications were drawn up, the US did not consider a bombing attack on its own territory to be a major threat. After all, the major powers that could be considered a threat were well beyond the range of conventional bombers, and it would be many years before that would change. The presumed task of the fighter arm of the Air Corps was to patrol America's vast coastlines, and this meant an emphasis on range and reliability rather than high altitude performance. There was also the consideration that many senior officers in the Air Corps were advocates for the bomber rather than the fighter. They believed that fast, heavy, high altitude bombers, bristling with defensive guns, would be the main weapon of war in the future, and these aircraft would not require escorts. This line of thinking also appears to have not considered foreign service. Even though the Curtis P-36 was already receiving export orders for European nations, few paused to consider that this new fighter might benefit from higher altitude performance, and if they did, they were in the minority. 
And so, when Donovan Berlin submitted his design plans for a new fighter, one that would become the P-40, its greatest weakness, ironically, would be viewed with approval. Once again, he based his design on the airframe of the P-36, and once again he made use of the Allison V-12. But this time, owing to the modest altitude requirements, he did away with the complicated turbocharger and selected a single-stage supercharger instead. Like the XP-37, it looked fast when compared to the more compact and stubbier looking P-36, but there were some significant changes. The most eye-catching was the fitting of the coolant radiator to the underside of the fuselage, just aft of the wing trailing edge, a look that would later be replicated in the P-51. The liquid cooling unit itself was installed underneath the fuselage rather than within, and this, combined with the lack of a bulky intercooler, meant that the pilot and the engine were once again within the same postcode. This design was submitted as the Model 75P, and once again its estimated performance was impressive enough for the Army to order a prototype as the XP-40. A contract was signed at the end of April 1938, authorising Berlin to take the 10th production P-36A and convert it to this new specification. The prototype made its maiden flight on the 4th of October 1938, with test pilot Edward Elliott at the controls. Initial tests of the XP-40 were disappointing. It proved to be unstable during takeoff, owing to the long nose and a narrow undercarriage, and its rate of climb was almost a third slower than that of the old P-36. Even more troubling was the top speed, as it barely managed to exceed 300 miles an hour at 12,000 feet. Following wind tunnel tests on scale models in November of 1938, the XP-40 was quickly modified to a new configuration. The air scoop from the top of the cowling was removed, and in its place the machine gun fairings were enlarged to double as air ducts. These then merged further back before feeding into the carburetor. The radiator was moved forward and reinstalled under the nose, changing the outline of the aircraft considerably, and a two-pipe exhaust system was installed that gave a slight boost to engine power. In this new guise, the XP-40 was ready just in time to compete in the competition trials, which had been delayed until March. The only other competing aircraft was the Seversky AP-9. Other, more advanced aircraft were in development, some utilising turbocharged engines, but none of these were far enough along in their development to warrant full consideration. Though the XP-40 had yet to fully satisfy the performance requirements, its low cost and ease of production secured it the win. The victory resulted in the largest order for fighter aircraft in the US at the time. The US Army placed an order for 524 aircraft, under the designation P-40, with the contract valued at $12.9 million. Before production got underway, further changes were made. The XP-40 had outperformed its competitor, but it was not living up to its own performance expectations. A top speed of 360 miles an hour had been promised, but the prototype was barely managing 340 miles an hour, even after all the modifications to improve its streamlining. Subsequent tests showed that with some further modifications, the required speed could be achieved. A collection of minor changes were made to the airframe, mostly focused around reshaping the radiator, and the XP-40 was then re-equipped with the more powerful Allison V-1710-33. Following these changes, in December of 1940, it finally achieved a top speed of 366 miles an hour at 15,000 feet. The Army was satisfied, and 14 months, and many modifications after the XP-40's first flight, the aircraft was officially put into production as the P-40 Warhawk. Known in-house as the Model 81, the aircraft went into full production in March of 1940. As no service test aircraft had been ordered as the YP-40, the first three P-40s from the production line were used for military evaluations. With a top speed of just 357 miles an hour, when fully fueled and armed, the P-40 didn't meet the official speed goal set by the Army, but it was close enough. The Army was desperate for fighters, Curtis was able to deliver said fighters at least a year sooner than its competitors, and there was always the promise of improvement. Additionally, foreign orders were already piling up from Europe, which meant that Curtis would be keeping up its production regardless, so the Army might as well make use of it. The P-40 officially entered service with elements of the 8th Pursuit Group, based at Langley Field in Virginia, in June of 1940. Shortly after this, the 20th Pursuit Group in California received their P-40s, and by the end of September, over 200 had been delivered, the last going to the 31st Pursuit Group in Michigan. 
For pilots who were upgrading from the old P-36, the P-40 often proved to be an initial disappointment. Though the P-40 was faster, its wing area had remained the same, with the only change being the reinforcement of its internal structure. Because of this, the wing loading had increased, going from 22.9 pounds per square foot on the P-36 to just under 29 pounds per square foot on the P-40. This of course had a detrimental effect on its handling. That was not to say that the P-40 handled poorly, in fact it was comparatively nimble compared to many other monoplane fighters being built at the time. It just had the misfortune of following an aircraft that was particularly well known for its responsiveness, and thus was felt to be a bit heavy. Though the complaints from US pilots were justified, they were only experiencing the P-40 in its raw first iteration, and some of its greatest virtues would not become apparent until it saw actual combat. Moreover, an improved version of the P-40 was already on the way. After accepting delivery of the first 200 P-40s, the Army Air Corps deferred the rest of their order so that Curtis could complete an urgently needed batch for the French. These were known as the H-81-A, and they featured several improvements over the original P-40. Changes included a redesigned landing gear, where small doors were added to provide a smooth fairing for the struts, and a plate covered the wheel recess during flight to improve streamlining. Short, curved exhaust stacks replaced the manifold exhaust. A dedicated carburetor intake was reintroduced, allowing the blast tubes for the guns to be shortened, and the oil and coolant radiators were redesigned and clustered together. This increased the size of the P-40's so-called chin, further contributing to the outline that makes it so recognisable today. Originally, the P-40 came equipped with four machine guns, two 50 caliber machine guns in the nose, and a 30 caliber machine gun in each wing. But the French Air Force believed it was undergunned. They requested a redesign to have four wing guns, with the 30 cows being replaced with their own 7.5mm FN Brownings. All of these changes represented a significant improvement on the design, and as such they would be applied to the US production models under the designation of P-40B. What would have been the P-40A was most likely the configuration of the XP-40 after winning the Pursuit competition, but before it had been modified, and seeing as that variant was never built, the latter was skipped, though it would be retroactively added to a single reconnaissance aircraft later on. The French P-40s were still being built in the factory when the country fell, and the order was quickly taken over by the British, equally desperate for aircraft, who also placed their own order as well. These were known as the Tomahawk Mark I. The RAF retained the 50 caliber guns in the nose for most models, but the wing-mounted guns were exchanged for 303 caliber weapons as they were easier to source. Despite going on to serve with distinction with British and Commonwealth forces later on, the P-40s made a very poor impression when they were first delivered. Much of the batch still had French instrumentation, and was thus in the heretical metric system, and the Tomahawk lacked any of the protection expected in a frontline fighter. It had no armour plating, no bulletproof canopy, and worst of all, no self-sealing fuel tanks. They also proved difficult to handle, as the RAF pilots were used to performing three-point landings in their Hurricanes and Spitfires. A three-point landing in the Tomahawk was not advised, as it would either lead to a collapsed landing gear, or an equally unfun ground loop. This was because the landing gear of the P-40 was somewhat of an outlier. It retracted rearwards, as opposed to those found on many other World War II aircraft which retracted laterally towards the fuselage. This was a legacy of the design of the P-36, and it was something that would never be changed, which made the P-40 difficult to transition to for pilots who had flown other aircraft previously. Though the arrival of any additional fighters was highly welcome to the RAF at this critical juncture, the Mark I Tomahawks were not used as frontline fighters in Europe. Unwilling to have their pilots perforated or immolated due to a lack of protection, the RAF used them predominantly as trainers. Additionally, they had quickly realised that the Allison engine, with its single-stage supercharger, lacked the high-altitude performance that was needed in this theatre. Sorties often took place at 20, 25, or even 30,000 feet, and the Tomahawk's engine started to struggle above 15,000. Because of this, the only combat operations intended for the Tomahawk at this time would have been as close air support in the event of a German invasion. During their early service, some Tomahawks received various upgrades, or sometimes had their nose-mounted 50 caliber guns swapped out by 303s, and these were all covered under the generalized designation of the Tomahawk Mark II. 
Because of this, the next true iteration of the Tomahawk was the Mark IIA, and it was a step in the right direction. Ostensibly a P-40B, it came with six machine guns as standard, pilot armour, armour-plated fuel tanks, a bullet-resistant canopy, and the provision for underwing bomb racks. This last modification did have an impact on the overall top speed, but the trade-off for ground strike capabilities was considered worth it. All that being said, the RAF still felt it lacked the range and survivability to be used long term, and they only placed a modest order for just 110 aircraft whilst Curtis worked on an improved version. This came in the form of the P-40C, known in-house as the Model H81A-2. It inherited all the improvements made in the P-40B, and it also featured new radio equipment, and most importantly it now came with an improved fuel system. Not only did this feature self-sealing fuel tanks as standard, but it came with the provision of a 52-gallon drop tank that greatly improved the aircraft's range. In Britain, this version of the aircraft was known as the Tomahawk Mark IIb. After an initial order of 9 aircraft was received in early 1941 for testing and service evaluation, the British quickly placed 3 more, with 930 aircraft being ordered in total. This would seem like a large order for an aircraft that was apparently useless in European skies, but these were not intended for Europe. These were going to North Africa. Before we talk about the P-40's remarkable service life, I'd like to give a shout out to the sponsor of today's video, War Thunder. As many of you have guessed by now, I play War Thunder quite a bit, and there's a good reason for that. It offers a ridiculous amount of variety. It has over 2,000 vehicles to choose from, ranging from aircraft to tanks, ships and helicopters. It covers over a century of development, giving you control over vehicles from the First World War all the way up to the modern era. It has different game modes that suit different playstyles and skill levels. It's free to play, and it's fully cross-platform between PC, PS5, Xbox Series XS, and the previous console generations, meaning everyone plays together on the same servers. The variety found in War Thunder is what got me into it in the first place, but the thing that's kept me is the experiences, the interactions, and the memories I've made playing with other people. It is hilariously good fun if you squad up with a couple of mates, or a couple of strangers for that matter, and of course you get the tactical benefits of coordination and teamwork as well. This is particularly useful if, like me, you enjoy playing in VR when it's often difficult to check your six without breaking your neck. Of course, it's equally useful in the other game modes as well, and I'm as partial to driving tanks as the next fellow, but flying about in various aircraft is still my preferred way to play. So to get started with War Thunder, click on the link in the description below to sign up for free, and in doing so, you'll receive a free premium tank, aircraft and ship, along with a 7-day account boost, and of course, you'll be supporting this channel as well. You might also bump into me, as I play this game a lot, when I actually get free time, so don't be afraid to say hello after you've casually blown me out of the sky. Once again, thank you to War Thunder for sponsoring today's video, and now let's get back to the P-40 and its adventures in Africa. By mid-1941, the RAF's main fighter in this theatre, the Hawker Hurricane, was beginning to struggle. The arrival of later models of the Messerschmitt Bf109e, and early models of the Bf109f, had shifted the balance of power, and the Hurricanes were starting to take heavy losses. Worse still, the Italians were taking delivery of their first Mackie C202s, which would quickly prove to be an effective and deadly dogfighter. As most of the combat over Africa took place at altitudes below 15,000 feet, the Tomahawk would not be hampered by its biggest defect, and the RAF quickly twigged onto the idea of using them to replace the Hurricane. Approximately 300 Tomahawk Mark IIbs were shipped to Africa in May of 1941 to serve with the newly formed Desert Air Force. The first unit to receive them was No. 250 Squadron of the RAF, who quickly relocated to Egypt to bolster the air defences around Alexandria. Shortly after this, Tomahawks joined No. 3 Squadron of the Royal Australian Air Force, and No. 2 Squadron of the South African Air Force. In June, No. 112 RAF Squadron, who had been operating Gloucester Gladiators, also exchanged into the Tomahawks, probably not without a sense of relief. It was 250 Squadron that would finally give the P-40 its combat debut. On the 6th of June, Flying Officer Jack Hamlin claimed to have shot down a CAD Z-1007, but the kill was not recognised as there were no witnesses. 
Then, on the 8th of June, Hamlin shot down another Z-1007, and once again he was in danger of not getting the credit. In truth, he had set the bomber on fire, and it had then been finished off by an anti-aircraft battery. But as he had done most of the damage, he was credited with the kill. Following their arrival, and after a brief working up period, the Tomahawks found themselves getting very busy very quickly. Operation Battleaxe, the new British offensive in Egypt, and Operation Exporter, the Allied invasion of Vichy-controlled territory in the Middle East, had both been launched in June. Both campaigns saw Tomahawks take part in their first major engagements, and they did not disappoint. Pilots quickly realised that the P-40 was not only excellent in a dive, but it could take a remarkable amount of damage. This made them ideal for ambushing formations of lumbering bombers, something pilots quickly learned to do with the ease of a peregrine falcon chasing a pigeon. Interestingly, one of their first victims during Operation Exporter was a flight of American bombers. On the 28th of June, Tomahawks from No. 3 Squadron savaged a flight of Vichy-operated Martin Marilyns, shooting down all six of them in the span of just a few minutes. The Tomahawk also had the occasional fight with the Dawatine D520, which was considered by many to be the best fighter built by France up till that point. But most were either destroyed on the ground or didn't get a chance to fight before the local armistice, so their combat capabilities against the P-40 are not fully known. In both the Middle East and Africa, the victory tallies quickly climbed, and on the 7th of July, Australian pilot Clive Caldwell became the first Tomahawk ace. He would not be the last, and he himself would go on to achieve much more. Not only would he become the highest scoring P-40 ace from any air service, but he would become the highest scoring Allied ace in Africa, and the highest scoring Australian pilot of the entire war. It wasn't long before the P-40s attracted the ire of German pilots, and soon enough there were multiple encounters with the BF-109Es. The P-40 had three advantages over the BF-109E. It was much faster in a dive, it was more manoeuvrable in a dogfight, and it had a much sturdier airframe. Conversely, the BF-109E had three main advantages over the Tomahawks. It was much faster in a climb, it had a much higher service ceiling, and it was equipped with a pair of hard-hitting 20mm cannons. As the P-40 performed best at lower altitudes, Allied pilots were often forced to give up the initiative. Usually, they would endure an initial attack from above, trust in the airframe to take the hit if they didn't evade quickly enough, and then turn into their opponents and bring their guns to bear in a head-on pass. It was an incredibly risky tactic, but when used correctly, the Tomahawk was able to hold its own against this German foe, and in the right hands, it could give as much trouble as it received. Out of all its virtues, it was the Tomahawk's ability to soak up damage that endeared it most to many pilots as the fighting intensified in the latter half of 1941. There are numerous accounts of P-40s making it back to their airfields with countless bullet holes riddled throughout their airframe, and one of the best examples of this involved Clive Caldwell on the 29th of August. On that day, he had the misfortune of flying back to base alone when he was pounced upon by a pair of BF-109s. One of these was flown by Werner Schroer, a young German pilot. He had recently scored his fifth kill, making him an ace, and he intended to make Caldwell his sixth. But Caldwell was having none of it. Despite himself sustaining three separate wounds from shrapnel in the initial attack, he turned his tomahawk into the attacking Messerschmitts. After a heated engagement in which Caldwell shot down the other 109 and damaged Schroer's, an unlucky hit set his tomahawk on fire. Schroer broke off, hoping to limp back to base and claim a kill, but the fire aboard Caldwell's P-40 put itself out just before he was about to bail. Despite being hit by more than 100 bullets and five 20mm cannon shells, his tomahawk carried him safely back to base, and he lived to fight another day. This example of durability was one that was often repeated, as the tomahawk bore the brunt of the fighting throughout the rest of 1941. And although their effectiveness received a notable check in October, as the BF-109F became available en masse, they continued to be vital tools in the Allied war effort. Though they were now significantly outclassed in one-on-one -on -one fights, Tomahawk squadrons made the most of their advantages with attacks of opportunities, and of course they were still superior to many other aircraft operating in this theatre. By this point, they were a confirmed menace to Axis bombers and heavy attack aircraft, and they now had a look that matched their reputation. 
In September, tomahawks of number 112 squadron started appearing with shark mouths painted on their nose. This was not the first use of this paint scheme, and it was most likely inspired by the shark-mouthed BF-110s encountered over the Mediterranean, but it was the P-40s that became the first Allied aircraft to feature this paint scheme on a regular basis. This quickly caught on with other air units, and by the end of the year it had become a hallmark of the Tomahawks in Africa. The last major operation of 1941, Operation Crusader, saw some of the Tomahawk's greatest exploits, but it would also signal the beginning of the end. As the campaign to reach and break the siege at Tobruk rapidly evolved, the use of fighter-bomber tactics quickly took on an important role. Tomahawks and Hurricanes flew ahead of the ground forces to attack Rommel's lines of supply and communication at the rear. Typical missions would involve two squadrons, one providing top cover while the other sought out enemy columns, truck convoys, and supply dumps. These were strafing missions, the aircraft didn't usually carry many bombs, but they still proved to be moderately effective. Other missions included fighter sweeps and bomber escorts, with large air battles occurring on a regular basis. Owing to the low altitude of the strafing runs, and the presence of superior enemy fighters, losses were heavy, no fewer than 9 aircraft were lost on one day alone in November, but the Tomahawks also scored some of their greatest victories during these final bloody weeks. On the 25th of November, 15 Tomahawks from numbers 3 and 112 squadrons encountered no fewer than 70 aircraft during a sweep. This formation included BF-110s, JU-87s, JU-88s, and even some Italian CR-42 biplanes, all escorted by BF-109s providing top cover. Despite being outnumbered by the escorts, the Tomahawks attacked with success. 112 Squadron claimed two destroyed and two probables for the loss of one aircraft, and No. 3 Squadron claimed seven destroyed, one probable, and eight damaged, again for the loss of just one fighter. On the 5th of December, another huge air battle occurred when 22 Tomahawks from 250 Squadron encountered a formation of 40 JU-87s escorted by German and Italian fighters. 14 Stukas were shot down, with Clive Cardwell himself claiming no fewer than 5, and the escorting fighters only shot down 5 Tomahawks, giving 250 Squadron a victory ratio of 3 to 1. Combats continued throughout the month, but time was running out for the Tomahawks. Their numbers dwindled with each combat loss, and the surviving aircraft were logging combat hours at an alarming rate. What is more, operations in desert conditions caused considerable wear on the engines. At times, less than half of the Tomahawk force was combat ready, as the rest were grounded for various mechanical reasons, usually involving heat and or sand. Their numbers could not be replenished, the last Tomahawk had been delivered in August, after which production had ceased. But this was not the end of the P-40's involvement in Africa, or indeed with Commonwealth forces in general. The Tomahawk's production was only terminated because Curtis had begun producing a newer, more powerful version of the P-40, one that would become known by many as the Kitty Hawk, but we're not quite ready to discuss that yet. The Tomahawk's active, violent, but successful service life with Commonwealth forces contrasted sharply with the experiences of those operated by the United States. Before the attack on Pearl Harbor, the Warhawk, as it was known in the United States, had enjoyed a relaxed service life. As the US was not yet at war, Curtis had prioritised deliveries to the British, and as a result, not a huge number of early Warhawks had entered US service. There were the 200 of the original P-40 order, which had since been upgraded with better protection and fuel tanks. Then there were the 131 P-40Bs, and then 193 of the P-40Cs. Not considering training accidents and the like, this meant the US had just over 500 Warhawks on strength by the end of 1941. Some were stationed on the continental United States for coastal patrol, but the majority went to various bases in Hawaii, the Caribbean, Panama, and the Philippines. Hawaii was considered an especially cushy deployment, with short work days, comfortable accommodation, and plenty of fun to be had when off duty. Pilots were trained in their tomahawks, but it was the kind of off-hand training conducted by a country that wasn't expecting to go to war for some time, if at all, and certainly not by the end of 1941. While the tomahawks were flying combat duties over the sands of Libya, the closest thing the warhawks had to active service were a series of passive missions. The first deployment of US P-40s outside routine patrol work was in August, P-40s of the 33rd Pursuit Squadron were deployed to Iceland via the carrier USS Wasp. 
Their mission was to enforce the neutrality of Iceland by denying its use to the warring powers, thus showing the public back at home that America was maintaining its policy of isolation. Of course, they were in fact denying its use to the Axis powers only, and allowing the Allies free use, but that was kept under wraps for as long as possible. Despite being the most advanced fighter in the US inventory, the first six months of the P-40's wartime service with America was nothing short of disastrous, something that greatly soured its reputation in the eyes of both the public and the service members who had yet to appreciate its qualities. The P-40's poor service record was not due to some inherent design defect that made it unsuitable for the Pacific, but it was rather due to a combination of Japanese aggressiveness, poor pilot training, inept military leadership, and one unhealthy dose of bad luck. The combat debut of the Warhawk, if you could call such a disaster as such, was of course the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Despite having a defence force of 231 fighters, 115 of which were P-40s or late model P-36s, only a handful survived to get off the ground. Of these, five were P-40s flown by pilots from the 44th and 47th Pursuit Squadrons. None of these were based at Wheeler Field, and were thus spared the first wave of the attack, but despite the warning signs that war was coming, the defenders at Pearl Harbor were so caught unawares that some of their P-40s took off without ammunition loaded in their guns. Nevertheless, by day's end, the P-40 had claimed its first six kills at the hands of American pilots, for the loss of just two. The pilots credited were Second Lieutenants John Danes, Kenneth Taylor, and George Welch. Taylor and Welch tend to get most of the fame, with Danes being unfairly left out. This might have been because he had the least combat time of the three that day, but it was more likely because he was shot down and killed by a friendly anti-aircraft battery, and this of course would spoil the romantic story of the valiant defenders of Pearl Harbor, defenders who were placed against insurmountable odds mostly as a result of complacent leadership. Following shortly after Pearl Harbor, the P-40s stationed in the Philippines fared even worse. On paper, the defending air force was considerable. The 24th Pursuit Group had approximately 227 fighters, including 100 P-40s, and many of these were the newer P-40Es, which we will come to later. But in practice, it was another matter entirely. Many of the pilots were fresh out of flight school, and those that had flight experience had mostly practiced the basics and did not have a firm grasp of combat tactics. Many of them were unfamiliar with the P-40s, and the newer P-40Es were still presenting teething problems. Additionally, much of the 24th Pursuit Group was still flying the obsolete P-36, some of which had been in service for over two years and were thoroughly worn out. In direct contrast to this was the overwhelming Japanese aerial assault force. The combined strength of Army and Navy air units totaled some 541 aircraft, and this included at least 100 of the formidable A6M20s. Unlike their opponents, many of the men who flew these aircraft were already veterans from combat over China, and they had been brought to a high state of training. Despite ample warnings of impending attack, the air units in the Philippines were all but wiped out on December the 8th. Unlike Pearl Harbor, this was not a complete result of poor planning by the defenders, but rather the intervention of poor luck and poor weather. That morning, heavy fog had delayed the takeoff of the Japanese strike forces by several hours. The US air units were unaware of this. They took off as planned, performed their patrols, encountered no Japanese aircraft to their surprise, exhausted their fuel supplies, and returned to base just in time to be caught on the ground by the delayed Japanese assault. This factor was of course unknown to the general American public, and the decimation of the P-40s at both Pearl Harbor and the Philippines left a permanent scar on the aircraft's reputation. But this unhappy start was quickly offset by the exploits of another American unit flying P-40s. This was the first American volunteer group, who began flying alongside pilots of the Chinese Air Force in late 1941. But by the spring of 1942, the newspapers had given them a new name, the Flying Tigers. Contrary to some popular opinions, the Flying Tigers did not see combat before America's entry into the war. The latter half of 1941 saw them going through a period of intense training as they got to know their aircraft. These were 100 Tomahawk Mark II Bs that had been diverted from their original British delivery to be shipped to Burma. Based in southwest China, the AVG commenced operations on the 10th of December, 
The 3rd Pursuit Squadron was sent south to take part in the defence of Rangoon. Meanwhile, the 1st and 2nd Pursuit Squadrons were stationed further north to defend Kunming, one of the key points along the Burma Road. Japanese fighters presented a new challenge for the P-40, and a decidedly different set of tactics were employed compared to those used in Africa. Its main opponents, the K-27 and the more advanced K-43, were far more manoeuvrable at lower speeds, so the P-40s now employed the same boom and zoom tactics that they themselves had defended against when fighting the BF-109s over Libya. The Flying Tigers got their nickname for two things, the painted shark nose that adorned almost all their fighters, and the extreme aggressiveness in which they engaged their opponents. So long as they didn't get dragged into a protracted dogfight, they frequently came out as the victors in most engagements. The Japanese fighters were slower in a straight line, and their light airframes lacked the endurance for high-speed dives, be it for attack or defence. And they were, of course, far more susceptible to damage compared to the sturdy P-40. During the seven months of operations, from the 10th of December 1941 to the 15th of July 1942, the Flying Tigers claimed the destruction of 297 enemy aircraft. 229 of these were destroyed in air-to-air combat for the reported loss of just four P-40s. That was the official US record, though nowadays multiple researchers believe this number to be considerably inflated. But although the true figures may never be known, the AVG did dominate the skies above Burma, which was a stark contrast to the disastrous situation on the ground. July did not mark the end of the Flying Tigers. The AVG was reorganised to form the nucleus of the 23rd Fighter Group, and they would continue to establish and maintain air superiority throughout the region for the rest of the war. But by this point, they were using the P-40E, a thoroughly different beast, and the time of the original P-40 Warhawk had long passed. These original P-40s, which were based on the Curtis Model 81, spent most of their time fighting for the British and Commonwealth forces. By the time they saw action in the hands of American pilots, they were old and outclassed in many respects, and indeed, they were technically obsolete airframes. They had been a product of necessity. As much of their airframe was based on the old P-36, they could be designed and built at a faster rate, and at a cheaper price, than the other aircraft that were being proposed to the Army Air Corps. In 1939, this became a matter of great importance as Europe went to war, and the export orders started flooding in. But it also meant that the P-40 inherited some weaknesses. But by the middle of 1940, long before the first Tomahawks flew over Africa, Curtis was already hard at work on correcting the biggest weakness that held the P-40 back, its underpowered engine. Though this problem was never fully solved, it did result in the development of a newer version of the P-40 under a new model designation as the Hawk 87. From late 1941, these would begin to appear in greater and greater numbers, forming the bulk of the P-40's total production run. Like the first generation P-40s, these would serve in most major theatres of the Second World War, and it is because of this that I am splitting this video into two parts. Not only does it keep things simple, but it gives me a chance to give my poor voice some time to recover, as I'm still dealing with all of the fun that is long Covid. You will notice that I have omitted the P-40s that were operated in the Soviet Union. The vast majority of these were later models, with only about 10% being the P-40Cs or P-40Bs. Because of this, I will combine the summary of their operations in the second part of the video to keep things from getting complicated. So don't panic, I have not forgotten them. I am hoping to release these as back-to-back videos, but depending on how long the editing takes, and how my lungs feel, there may be a video in between them. Either way, part 2 is coming out soon, and there won't be the sort of long delay that we had with the Wellington video. Once again, thank you to War Thunder for sponsoring today's video. Don't forget to click on the link below to sign up for free, and claim your free premium benefits. And thank you all so, so much for watching. A big thank you as always goes out to the wonderful people over on Patreon, with a special shout out to the Wing Commanders, the channel's top tier supporters. Hopefully I haven't missed anyone who may have signed up this week, but I'll be sure to get the list updated for part two. Thank you all so much, and I'll catch you all next time. Goodbye.